I just have two words to say about this morning. Um, wow. Wow. What a, what a hotbed of creativity and innovation uh, Vancouver Island is. Uh, you're you're world-class. Everything I knew before, but also everything I've learned in preparation for coming here, and everything I've heard this morning and everyone I've met convinces me that Vancouver Island is poised for transformation. There's an alchemy here that the rest of Canada needs. For example, I couldn't help think of what would happen if young people from Tofino, where's the mayor, met with young people in Attawapiskat. Thank you for your ingenuity and for your commitment and for your steadfastness. Thank you for taking on what must sometimes feel like a pretty thankless task especially in a culture that is easily distracted by the fact that there is no more important initiative, job, profession, calling, or mindset than taking care. Taking care of our children, taking care of our families, our food, our housing, our justice, our air, water, trees, rocks, our birds, and our ocean. Thank you for bearing witness during those times when healthy communities was not seen as a political or economic priority. And you may feel that this is the way it will always be. But I want to tell you that the political and cultural winds are shifting. Instead of contending with a headwind, you can start relying on a tailwind, which means that you can now be bolder than your wildest imaginings. You can take the lead and usher in an era of upstream, upstream problem solving and caring that will surely unleash the full power of Vancouver Islanders. I'd like to start by telling you about someone just like you. Addie lost her fourth child, her youngest son Jack, when he was just 14 months old. As you can imagine, she was devastated. To that point, she had enjoyed a happy family life as the mother of four and the wife of John, who was a Hamilton, Ontario businessman. And then her baby died from drinking contaminated milk, or what at the time was called the summer complaint. The time was the late 1800s, and even though the knowledge about what constituted safe food handling and preparation was well known, that information wasn't readily available to the ordinary family, particularly those in rural Canada. The course of Addie's life changed over the next five years. The private, self-effacing, no experience with public speaking Addie was replaced with the public Adelaide. She was determined to prevent further deaths like those of her son and resolved to devote her life to the, what she called the betterment of education for young mothers. She became bolder than she ever thought she could be. And in 1897, she founded Women's Institute in Stony Creek, Ontario. Some of you are nodding. With a mandate to improve the conditions of life for rural women through the promotion of domestic science education. Terminology may seem a bit quainted, antiquated, but her mandate was soon expanded to include self-improvement, government lobbying, and community betterment. Within a decade, there were more than 500 branches across Canada. Today, women's institutes exist in more than 70 countries around the world with a combined active membership of 9 million women. Ever heard of them? You know, many, many people haven't. 
Recently, the Canadian Encyclopedia published a list of the 30 great Canadians you may not know, but should. Not surprisingly, Adelaide Hoodless and Women's Institute was on the list. It's a Canadian irony that Women's Institute is better known in the UK than in Canada. Do you remember that British film, Calendar Girls, starring Helen Mirren? That's a fictionalized account of a unique fundraising project of some members of the North Yorkshire Women's Institute. They were raising money for cancer, you're nodding, for cancer research by posing without clothes for a calendar. But here's the thing. In a recent survey of the top 10 social innovations in the world, that's in the world, Women's Institute was on it. Why? Because Women's Institute is credited with ushering in the first wave of feminism. That's right, before Nellie McClung and the Group of Five, before Rosemary Brown, before Cindy Blackstock, Doris Anderson, or Betty Friedan, or Gloria Steinem, or before the women of Idol No More, there was Adelaide Hoodless and a movement of mainly rural Canadian women promoting healthy communities. That's the kind of impact you want, isn't it? To enhance the resilient and adaptive problem-solving capacity of individuals, networks, families, neighborhoods and communities. To make Vancouver the most robust network of healthy communities anywhere. To make caring for all life a political and economic priori a priority. And to infuse our society with beauty, wonder, tenderness, and love. So how did Adelaide and Women's Institute do it? She was confronting as formidable a set of challenges as you are. Adelaide never went to high school, yet she wrote and published a textbook for teachers, which became so popular it became known as the Little Red Book. That's not all. She pioneered the new discipline of domestic science or home economics. She became a major force behind the formation of three university faculties of household science. And incidentally, she went on to co-found the National Council of Women and the Victorian Order of Nurses. It's kind of like some of the folks in this room. But how did she and Women's Institute manage to achieve what we all seek? Programmatic excellence, institutional reform, political influence, plus, plus, and here's the big one, cultural shift. I spent the last 12 years exploring answers to that question. I've paid particular attention to the emerging world of social innovation, looking for useful, practical insights about social change that lasts, change that moves the dial, that changes the paradigm, that tips a system, that rallies an island, a region, or a province. And during those 12 years, I've met, I've read, I've studied, and I've stumbled while applying the lessons and insights about social innovation from around the world to my own work and to make them more generally available to people like yourself. By the way, if you've never heard of social innovation, there's more than 30 million definitions available to you on Google. Uh, one of the best, perhaps the most scientific in my <coughs> opinion, is mine, which I write about in, in my book. <laughs> and here it is. I define social innovation as a combination of the old and the new, accompanied by a dash of surprise. So take that, Google. But here's what I've discovered in my 12-year journey. I've discovered that novelty isn't enough. Neither is efficiency or program quality or dedication, hard work, 
or loyal supporters or a sophisticated strategy or a robust advocacy campaign or even more money. Are they essential? Absolutely. Are they more than a good start? Certainly. But they're not enough to change behavior, to secure durable change and lasting impact, and to achieve the upstream results that you've come here to discuss. Just because you are right, because we are right, or that we have a shiny, proven solution, the world does not beat a path to our door. Darn. Eh? Ushering our bold vision, values, and best practices from the margins to the mainstream will not happen by accident. You must deliberately nurture the conditions in which the seeds of prevention, the seeds of resilience, the seeds of upstream thinking will flourish. And of course that depends on any number of things. But I've observed that one of the most important is to think and to act like a movement. And here's why. Movements do two things better than any group, any agency, any institution, any sector, any organization, any profession, any partnership, or, any, or what any association can do on its own. Movements, first of all, provide a vehicle for collaborating and cooperating across sectors, organizational boundaries, social and economic strata, origins, backgrounds, and jurisdictions. They are the ultimate inclusive container, encompassing the full assortment of actors and actions required for change that last. A movement is composed of thousands of small and big acts. They emerge out of a context in which thousands, if not tens of thousands, of individuals, networks, and groups are feeling and acting on the same impulses. And from these actions, seemingly all of a sudden, the next phase of a movement will erupt. It's impossible to predict which one person or which action by itself will ignite a spark or cause the next surge. And in fact, it doesn't really matter. The key for folks like yourselves is to provide the container and a way of communicating that enables everyone, not those of you who are in this room, but it enables everyone on Vancouver Island to see that their actions are part of something bigger than themselves. In other words, we have to deputize them to help people realize that their actions, no matter how big or how small, whether it's a book group, a small organization, a donation, a protest, a gathering, a garden, a refugee sponsorship, a blog post, a dance troupe, a yoga video, video or a healthy communities forum. One of those might be the one that lights the fire. The second thing that movements do is they shift the boundaries of what is socially acceptable and politically expected. Movements change culture. Culture are those deeply rooted personal, organizational, and societal habits, values, attitudes, and beliefs that keep things the way they are. That's what Adelaide confronted. That's what you're confronting. The biggest challenge for healthy communities is to increase cultural credibility and political receptivity. You may already have more than enough proven solutions. Perhaps what's needed now is to join up all efforts to achieve critical mass. Shifting billions of dollars from acute health care to healthy communities, or at least some of it, is a cultural challenge. Upstream practice is a cultural challenge. Poverty and unemployment is cultural. Fixing our food system is cultural. Culture is what people do when no one's looking over their shoulders. 
unless people's working relationships, their habits and mind change, mindsets inside and outside of formal systems are addressed, the best programs, your best techniques and methods will be trumped by the momentum of outmoded approaches. So movements provide a climate for new, by ide for new ideas, thereby creating the favorable political con conditions for the combination of legislative change, resource allocation, policy shifts, new stories, and new behaviors that you're looking for. In other words, movements embolden politicians. It doesn't happen any other way. That's what comes first. Politicians at all level need the cultural force of a healthy communities movement. Few politicians will step out on a limb without that force behind them. Otherwise, they won't be elected or re-elected. By the way, Adelaide Hoodless and her companions didn't set out to create a movement, and you don't have to either. You simply need, in my opinion, to spend more or to devote more of your time to support the movements you're already part of. And we'll dive into that a little bit deeper in, in the workshops we're going to do tomorrow and I suspect at the conference's conclusion as well. But what I'd like to do now is talk about three characteristics are, that are at the heart of modern social movements. So let's fast forward a hundred plus years from Adelaide's time. And here's here are the three characteristics that I am fascinated one. One, modern social movements are fueled by passionate amateurs. Two, they infuse beauty into their work. And three, they've learned to become wise travelers. So let me start with passionate amateurs. The richest source of creativity, innovation, and ingenuity that I've found are those individuals, families, neighbors, volunteers, citizens, healthcare workers, administrators, elected officials, professionals, who are constantly working to make things better. All of the social advances on Vancouver Island and that we've made in Canada would not have taken place without passionate amateurs. Their innovations are pure and life-giving. Some are destined to become our new institutions, like those inspired by Women's Institute. Now, here's why I describe these folks as passionate amateurs. You all know the expression, I'm sure, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, I'd like to propose a friendly amendment. If necessity is the mother of invention, then caring is the other parent. Passionate amateurs are inspired by caring and they're motivated by necessity. Someone or something that they care deeply about is vulnerable under siege or in trouble and they have no choice but to respond. I think passionate amateurs occupy the sacred headwaters of social innovation. Adelaide Hoodless was a passionate amateur. People who presented to you this morning are passionate amateurs. Procurement pioneers are passionate amateurs. Local farmers who understand that they're not just feeding their families and their neighbors, but they're also healing their, the planet are passionate amateurs. Local politicians who take responsibilities for challenges decades before senior levels of government do are passionate amateurs. Getting transit service in Mount Washington, or Mount Waddington, is the work of passionate amateurs. Passionate amateurs don't quit they can't quit. They're prepared to pour their life's energy into resolving the challenge. Their commitment is freely given beyond the boundaries of any job description or office hours or strategic plans or funding or fashion and political priorities. They're on the front line spotting 
and dealing with injustice years and sometimes decades before the issue seeps into the consciousness of our political institutions. And that's why movements must pay close attention to the solutions developed by those who live at the literal or figurative margins, whether that means in our community, our organizations, or our bureaucracy. Because those people are the disruptors who awaken us to new possibilities. The second characteristic of movements I'd like to talk about is the role of beauty. Now, the definition of beauty that I like best is one uh, proposed by Carolyn McGilvery. Carolyn says, dignity is beautiful. Carolyn is founder of Beauty Night, a wonderful social enterprise in the downtown east side of Vancouver. And her special touch with the invisible women of our society gets as close to pure beauty as anything I've ever seen. She offers manicures, pedicures, facials, massage, massages, hairstyling to women who have been abused, ignored, ridiculed, and exploited. Nothing is more beautiful than providing care in a way that preserves the dignity of the person receiving it, or receiving care with equal dignity. Someone looked at her work and said, that's the kind of beauty that will save the world. Too much of the conversation about social change is wrapped in the language of finance, strategy, and policy. While those are important considerations, they are limited in describing the caring world we want, and I think in offering the means to go there. So I'd like to propose that for a few moments at least, we consider using the language of beauty. Anne Michaels, in her book, Fugitive Pieces, wrote, we have to find a way to make beauty necessary and a necessity out of beauty. So yes, dignity is beautiful, but so is silliness. And talking and joy and intimacy and forgiveness and mystery and fun and commitment and grace and generosity and hospitality and celebration and reciprocity and pleasure and sharing a meal and reconciliation. They are all beautiful. In his poem, Crush, the spoken word poet Shane Coison from Penticton adds even more texture to this definition with these lines. This is from his poem, Crush. When a 10-year-old girl can go on to shock three bullies into silence, you know that you have determined your lifelong definition of beautiful. Bud Hall, founder of the University of Victoria's Office of Community-Based Research, has been tracking the evolution of movements in the 21st century. And he suggests that movements are shifting from simply describing the world we want to giving us the experience of what this new world would look like by using the power of dance and drama and ritual and ceremony and poetry and humor. Movements, he says, are increasingly about flow, networking, connectivity, immediacy, creativity, and sensual intimacy. The inescapable truth of wanting to make Vancouver Island a better place is that we must touch hearts before we can open minds. That's why the arts and social movements make such a good marriage. They are both iconoclastic set up by their very nature to challenge sacred cows. Arts bridge the silos that separate us as we confront today's pressing 
issues. Art creates new visions and new ways to engage. Painters, poets, singers, musicians, dancers, sculptors, storytellers, and other artists have been conducting, connecting heart and head for millennial. It would be foolhardy, I think, to proceed on our social change journey without their company and artistry. The third and final characteristic of movements that I'd like to talk about is the importance of becoming a wise traveler. And for me that means working not just with our friends and our allies, but also with our adversaries and with strangers. Now, I call this deep collaboration and it's particularly difficult for me. My, my pride does not like sharing credit or control. Hubris has a very safe home inside me. I only like collaborations that I'm in charge of <laughs> or partnerships that report directly to me or coalitions that follow my directions. Uh, I've learned it takes a long time for my behavior around collaboration to catch up with my beliefs about it. So let me, I want to give you, I want to give you one example before I close. The organization uh, that Erica mentioned that I co-founded, PLAN, was set up to help families who are worried about what would happen to their son or daughter after their children with disabilities, after their son or daughter with disabilities died. And one of the things that we did is we helped usher into, the, into being the world's only, still only, savings plan for people with disabilities. It's called the RDSP. It's like an RESP, only for people with disabilities. Today there's over $2 billion in collected deposits. In 10 years there'll be well over $10 billion. And we are well on our way to seeing people with disabilities as economic citizens rather than welfare recipients. But I want to go back. The original idea that we had at PLAN was pretty crude. It was kind of similar to a huge, rough, flawed piece of marble. We could see some kind of savings plan in the marble, but no one else could. Uh, and we had fused our idea with three other big ones, or two other big ones, because we, of course, wanted to save the world in one fell swoop. Uh, and we couldn't imagine any one of our big ideas proceeding without the others. So we spent, as a consequence, you could imagine, we spent years stubbornly paddling our own canoe <laughs> in the wilderness. And we were really getting nowhere until we learned to become wise travelers and we started to pay attention to all the other inhabitants of the ecosystem surrounding our bold but pretty chunky idea. You know, the people, they may surround your challenges as well. People who've betrayed you, or people you've betrayed, who've hurt you in some way, who you feel aren't pulling your weight. You know those kinds of people? We spent, we realized, and we spent time making peace with them. And that included people in corporations, receptive innovators in government, bridging innovators in foundations, and rival disability groups. I'm sure any other sector of society doesn't have the kind of rivalry that we have in the disability movement, so forgive me for going deep and revealing something that you probably have not experienced. But I want to give you a little example. There were a number of disability organizations at the national level who didn't support our idea for a savings plan. In fact, they actively lobbied against it. And then former finance minister, the late Jim Flaherty, appointed one of them to be on his expert panel to advise him on how to implement the disability savings plan. Well, I went ballistic because he didn't appoint me uh, or, or any representative from our organization plan, that kind of brought out the worst in me. We did everything we could to get on that panel, including contacting former premiers to intervene on our behalf. 
but to no look, to no luck, to no avail. So, you know how the song goes, breaking up may be hard to do. I think working together is even harder. In my case, I had to confront what the poet Elizabeth Smart calls the stadium of my ego. I had to deal with my territorial issues. Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> I had to deal with my dreams of glory to let go of my belief that my idea was the best one and the only one. So here's the thing. The final product was far better than anything we ever imagined and indeed anything that we propose. So clearly the required expertise and resources to achieve the kind of impact that we're now seeing was beyond our capacity expertise and role. And so that's why we needed to stop thinking solely like an organization and to spend more time thinking and acting like a movement. Lasting impact, in my observation, means that we have to become as willing to practice deep, deep collaboration, as willing to do that as we are about studying or staying abreast of the latest techniques and methodologies. Deep collaboration is a journey from hubris to humility. It's more about our convictions than our techniques. It's about uniting our inner spiritual life with our outer activist self and finding the source of our moral oxygen. It's also about the integrity of speaking wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. Unless there's tough, honest, civil conversations and respectful disagreements, then we're fooling ourselves. Deep collaboration won't emerge. So here's an image I like that I want to leave you with. Stones are polished by tumbling together, right? By the friction of interacting. Working together provides with a similar opportunity to policy, polish each other. Not only so that our rough spots and edges may be removed, but also so, so that we may begin to reflect one another in the common social project of public life. Dear people, we shouldn't ever part with anything that makes us human. We are a society too much in our mind. Yet our collective minds have not been successful in resolving our big social and environmental challenges. We overrate the mind's capacity. Our minds need help. Intelligence is enlightened by love, wrote the great French philosopher Simone Weil. So is strategy and funding. Power and politics are also enlightened by love. In reality, there is a passionate amateur in each of you, isn't there? Whatever role you play, our effectiveness improves when we fall in love with the issue. It's mystery, it's brokenness, and it's contradictions. Without that fo love, folks are more likely to walk away from a challenge, to blame others, to get distracted by a search for more technology and techniques, or to think that no one else cares. The necessity to do something is usually pretty clear. We have more than enough studies, data, reports, projections, and statistics about what's wrong, horrible, and not working. We now need to surround our challenges with love. We don't have to be fighting for justice and equality. We can be loving for justice, equality, and healthy communities. One of our most important challenges is to tap into what people care deeply about, to understand that adversity turns into creativity when we love. There are an awful lot of love 
sick people out there. Perhaps the real purpose of you coming together on April 21st, 2016, is to rally the lovesick. And that I am confident you already know a lot about. Thank you very much.